So good evening. Uh, before the lecture begins, it's kind of obvious to you that we're taking a survey tonight. So if you would just fill out that little form and just uh, leave it on the desk in front of you and we'll come and collect them at the end of the hour. And thank you very much for that. We, every once in a while we need to know who comes to this and what we should do better, so uh, thank you very much. Okay, um, let's now begin uh, this evening's Slack public lecture. Our, the topic of the lecture is superconductivity. Um, not a Marvel character, but um, a material or a class of materials. The speaker tonight is Giacomo Kozlovich. Uh, he's from, uh, from Italy, actually from Trieste, the corner of Italy where a name like Giacomo Kozlovich is perfectly logical. Um, he uh, went to the University of Trieste. He studied superconductivity. He realized that if you want to do great things in superconductivity, you have to come to California. So here he is. Uh, he did a postdoc in Berkeley and then uh, became a staff member at Slack, working at our X-ray laser facility here, which you'll learn something about. And uh, maybe without further ado, he'll tell you about how to make waves in a superconductor. So let's welcome Giacomo. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this lecture. I'm very excited about presenting this lecture to you, uh, not only because this is my topic of research, but also because it's one of my favorite topics uh, at all. So, um, so I, I will tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to know uh, the topic of superconductivity, how do I got to study it. How did I came here to California from Trieste and all this, this thing. So it all starts back in high school. So this is a, a photo of myself you know, from the yearbook uh, in high school. Actually, people told me that I look a little bit like Harry Potter, but whatever. Um, doesn't matter. Um, so this was myself in high school, just to give you that moment in time. And so I really wanted to change the world back then. And still I do. but. Back then, I was really strong about it. I really wanted to do something that uh, can make a real change about how we, we live in this world and the way that we are dealing with uh, energy, the, dealing with, the way we're dealing with other people around us. So I was uh, unsure between two choices when I had to choose about college. So one thing was really about the world and was I wanted to study politics, in particular, international relations. So this was one of the topic that I was into. And the other topic was physics. So do two very different topics. And the reason why I was into physics back then was because I felt that physics had something powerful in it. So you can actually discover something that can produce a lot of changes in the way that, that the world behaves. So back then, for example, I was fascinated by cold fusion, cold nuclear fusion. That was a big uh, buzz back then. And so I had the feeling that physics is something special. Uh, you can discover something that can make real changes. But it's kind of funny because the, the actual reason why I picked physics over uh, international relations is because I won a scholarship to study physics. So actually, I got into physics because of money. Probably I'm the only physicist that can say that. Um, all right, so I started studying physics, OK? so. I went to college and I was following a lot of different topics that I was into. I was into um, hydrogen production for like fuel cell cars. And I was, of course, into fusion, for example. Uh, but most of all, I was actually playing the drums. I, was, I had a pretty decent career as a drummer. Uh, so I was not sure I was finding my way in physics. But there was a point where I started to find out about superconductivity. And that was the turning point, I think. So superconductivity was so fascinating. Uh, it had a lot of application. It was a beautiful phenomenon. So I really want to talk about this today, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. So you can imagine one of the things that happened to superconductors, they can make magnets levitate. You can use them to build high-speed trains that levitate on a track. You can have medical uh, devices. When you go to an hospital and do an MRI, you're using actually a giant superconductor. It can help us for energy efficiency. 
it's used to build accelerators. So the LHC in, in, the, in Switzerland or the big upgrade that we're planning here at LCLS, they're all using superconducting uh, materials. So I was fascinated by the applications, but also by the beauty of uh, this phenomenon. So I really needed to study physics to find out about that. So, um, so the other beautiful thing that got me into this field was also lasers. So that was really exciting. And I found out that there's a lot more uh, than the lasers that we know from Star Wars. Actually, we, we have very powerful sources, light sources of lasers. And we can use those to study materials, to study what is around us, and possibly change it and control it. So this was extremely fascinating. So I decided to drop my, let's say not drop, hold on on my drumming career for a moment and come to the Bay Area. And uh, I came initially to the Lawrence Berkeley lab just across the Bay. And when I came there, actually, I started um, to gravitate around LCLS, which is this um, X-ray light source that we have here at SLAC. So it's actually when you came here, going through 280, you probably passed the accelerator that we use to do our experiments. So it's a two mile long accelerator. Uh, this one and produces X-ray pulses that we can use to do experiments. So when I came to Berkeley, I initially started doing experiments here. And these are some of the folks that I worked here. Actually, one of these gentlemen is my boss right now. Uh, so when they gave me an offer to come visit here and, and work for them, this was so exciting because this is the most a uh, powerful X-ray laser that is around is the first one, and it really allows us to do a lot of exciting things. And I will talk about this in detail, so don't worry if, you, uh, if it sounds confusing now. So let's go back to the basics, and let's try to understand what makes superconductors exciting. What is their main property? So to understand their main property, uh, we have to talk about resistance, so electrical resistance. So electro electrical resistance is what makes your uh, phone gets hot, for example, when you use it, or make your battery drain whenever you use your phone. So it's actually the law of physics that determines that when you try to draw current through a, a metal, a piece of metal, a conductor, you will have some dissipation of energy. That's a uh, part of nature. So you will always have some dissipation of energy that will produce heat. So this is uh, our starting point, and we want to understand why is that happening? What is it behind uh, um, resistance? So let's start from the basics. Let's start from an atom. So an atom is the starting point for us to make uh, materials, uh, matter. So let's imagine the simplest atoms that we can talk about. So a positive ion in the middle, and then a negative electron around. So a way that we have actually to depict the atoms is often just two balls, as I made here, so two particles with a particle or, or orbiting around uh, the other. So here you can see the electron going around the positive ion. Well, it's not quite exactly like this, and I will um, describe a little bit more in details. But if you really imagine a negative charge, the electron, and a positive charge, the ion, like this, like two particles, they will fall into each other. They will attract, to get, uh, attract themselves. So the reason why we can actually have atoms is because there is quantum mechanics. So there are different laws that apply to microscopic objects in respect to the laws that apply to macroscopic objects. And in quantum mechanics, for example, the electron is not much a particle just orbiting around an ion, but is actually a cloud. You can imagine that as a cloud that represents the probability of finding an electron in a certain position. And so this is often referred to as a wave function. So this is important because I will talk a lot about charge waves and um, uh, density of charge in this talk. So you have to imagine actually the atom is itself a cloud of charge. So let's try to put together materials with this atom. So let's arrange them in a crystal and let's put first just the ions, okay? So typically the way we think about uh, crystals is actually uh, arrays of ions. So they're very well organized, sometimes there are cracks and things, but the basic concept is that they are lattices of ions. And let's insert now the electrons. So what happened to the electrons is in, in for metals is that they actually, in the moment that we put them into material, they distribute around homogeneously, almost like a jelly that goes around the material. And so this is great because actually they can screen 
the ions, so the, the material is neutral, is not a very uh, strong uh, electrical charge. But the main concept that we start with is that this is an homogeneous uh, sea of electrons. So how does the current flow in this material? Well, if we apply a voltage, so we connect the battery to this material, we can imagine we have these electrons flowing around freely in this material. Well, how freely do they go? Can they hit something? Can they, uh, can they just bring current with no problem? Well, no, we have resistance. So resistance is actually the effect of these electrons flowing in the, the material, hitting something that stands out from this well-organized crystal. So for example, impurities, uh, a missing atom, a crack in the crystal, something like this can create resistance, for example. And other things are actually just intrinsic. So every ion vibrates, for example, and the vibration of these ions will hit these electrons and make them scatter and lose energy. So this loss of energy goes into heat. And this is exactly the type of resistance that we have in our materials when we try to uh, make a current in it. OK, so this so far was just the theory of conventional metals, which there are two important concepts here. Every electron is independent to each other. You can think as just one particle moving around. It, they don't talk with each other. They don't collaborate with each other. They're just independent particles. And the other important point is that they are homogeneous in this, in this picture. Well, this picture works fine for most metals and for semiconductors as well, but it definitely doesn't work for superconductors. So let's see what happened uh, when we cool down some of these materials. So the material that I just described, a metal, you cool it down, and I said there are two sources of, of resistance. One was the just impurities, and one was the ions moving, for example, let's say. Uh, this is kind of a simplification, but you can imagine the ions moving around will decrease as you cool down. You cool down uh, the material, and the ions will move less. So there are less chances that will hit an electron and, and, and produce resistance. Well, but you still reach a limit because you cannot get rid of impurities. There are other sources of, sources of scattering that you cannot just, just remove. Well, what happened to a superconductor instead? You cool it down, and then all of a sudden, there is a special temperature, the transition temperature at which this material just suddenly becomes superconductor. And when it becomes superconductor, the resistivity goes to zero. So it's a very different material than a normal metal. And this property of having zero resistance is actually very special. So you can imagine that uh, when I described before the laws of, of resistance, it means that if, if I apply a voltage and try to establish a current, I can actually take away the, bat the, the battery. I don't, need, I don't need a battery in this case because this, this current can keep flowing in the material without the need of a voltage applied. And it's actually interesting because people have tried to see how long can a current survive in a superconductor. And they estimated that the current can last for 100,000 years. So that's quite like forever, I think. Um, so this is an amazing, pro uh, amazing properties, property of these materials. And so you can imagine it will be very exciting to use it everywhere for you know, improve the efficiency of, of uh, the way we use energy on this planet. Well, there is a problem. So as I so showed before, this happened at a certain temperature. What is that temperature? OK, so let's compare it to some temperatures that we're used to. So for example, let's start up here with boiling water temperature to run the 12 Fahrenheit. Do you guys like Fahrenheit? I'll try to use it, OK. Um, <laughs> At uh, a certain point, I'll start dropping the Fahrenheit. Um, anyway, then water freezes around here. And it, here I put an arrow to tell you what's the range that you can encounter on Earth as a climate. So up here, we have Death Valley. And then Antarctica down here, very close to the dry ice temperature, which is minus 108 Fahrenheit. So that's already very cold. That's how cold it is in Antarctica. I never knew that. <laughs> OK. so. How do we get to superconductivity? Well, the first result of superconductivity was actually down here. So let's, let's start back to the dry ice temperature, Antarctica. Let's go down. Then we hit here liquid nitrogen. 
at minus 321 Fahrenheit. And then we go down to the absolute zero at minus 460 Fahrenheit. So the absolute zero is, is the end of the line. Below that, you cannot go. And at that point, you know, the, the atoms, everything stopped moving. And actually, it's, not, it's just a concept. You cannot reach it. Uh, so we have to get very close to this point. So we need to have liquid helium to be able to, to go to 4 Kelvin, which is just, few, just a, little, a little bit above the absolute zero. So you can imagine another virtual Earth where the hottest place was Antarctica. And that will not even make it, the coolest place on that planet will not make it uh, down to superconductivity. At least the first one that was discovered. So let me go through a little bit of history about it. So actually the person who discovered superconductivity was also the same person that uh, found out about uh, liquid helium and how to liquefy helium. So he had this special trick, of course. He was able to cool down things at very, at very low temperatures. So uh, the first thing that he did is just, okay, let's try to measure the resistance on some mercury. And this was the big breakthrough. So he saw that the resistivity of mercury was suddenly dropping down at 4.2 Kelvin, so very low temperatures. It's actually interesting to find out. He discovered this in 1911, so we're talking about more than a century ago. This, this is old stuff. But it took 46 years to understand how this was happening. So this was like very, uh, very challenging problem for physics. It took us a while to figure this out. And it was Bardeen, Cooper, and Schiffer that actually found out what was the mechanism. And I will talk about that. Uh, another interesting effect that you have in superconductors, they actually expel magnetic fields. So if you put a superconductor, this blue ball that I have here, into a magnetic field, and then you cool it down below TC, so TC is the transition temperature, well, it will expel the magnetic field. It doesn't want to have magnetic field inside. So this can lead actually to magnetic levitation. So if you have a magnet sitting here that generates this magnetic field, the two objects will repel each other and you will have a superconductor uh, that will actually levitate the magnet or vice versa. So actually this is what is shown in this, in this picture here. And it's one of the you know, fascinating ways of, of, of seeing superconductivity in place. It means that actually this whole superconductor have supercurrents all around it, shielding it from ma magnetic field. So let's get it back again. We can maybe understand better these applications that I talked before. One of the reasons why superconductors are so useful is because since they have no resistance, you can establish a current that is much, much larger than any other material. You can establish a current that is much larger than in copper or anything because to maintain a large current in copper, you need to apply a very large voltage. So instead of a superconductor, you can establish and it will stay there uh, as long as you keep it cold. So this is the way that all these applications operate. Uh, but of course, you can understand that, for example, for energy application, it's very hard to imagine power lines where you cool down a whole line to very, very low temperature. So the temperature is the biggest challenge we have for superconductivity. There is also other challenges, uh, uh, critical currents and stuff like this, but uh, the temperature is definitely the, the one that, is, that we're working the most on. Um, other interesting applications, uh, they've been recently used for quantum computers. So you guys probably heard about quantum computers. Uh, so in quantum computers, you can use instead of a bit as the fundamental unit that you use to do uh, computation, you can use a qubit, so a quantum bit. It's something that where instead of having zeros and ones, you will have superposition of zeros and ones. So you actually can have continuous variables. And these qubits are actually made of superconductors. But one of the reasons why it's very challenging to build quantum computers is because they're very sensitive to temperatures and they're very sensitive overall. So it would be nice to have something that is more stable. And we would like to make something that is uh, possible to be used at room temperatures, for example. So actually, somebody envisioned this and it's in Back to the Future. So I'm gonna show you here something fun. And this is another application that in my opinion is the best one, but I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, overboards. So we have Marty McFly in Back to the Future that flies on this skateboard that, that levitate on ground. And uh, 
actually they they did it. Uh, Lexus actually recently did um, uh, uh, hoverboard, so they had to build this device with high, uh, some high temperature superconductors that I will talk later about. And they built all this skate park with magnetic tracks uh, uh, underneath. So this is actually a real object that they built. Um, so remember what I was talking about changing the world? This is exactly what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> anyway, so okay, let's get back to the theory. So why is this, this material becoming superconductor? Uh, so this is part of the theory of, of uh, Bardeen Cooper Schiffer. And so it starts from the fact that when you have an electron, you still have a negative charge in that electron, right? And that can attract slightly the positive ions around it. So you can imagine that an electron going through a material will attract slightly the ions toward it. So that's that's some sort of electron ion interaction. So if you imagine now a second electron that was going there, oh, it will see actually this area as a positive charge, something where some positive charge went there. And so actually they say, okay, this is a very nice place to go. It has some electrical interaction. And so there is an attraction that is actually is uh, following the first electron. So this is something that is not allowed in the purely electrical terms because those are two negatively charged particles. They should not attract each other. They should repel each other. But because of this interaction with the ions, the ions, you can see them as a mediator here, they're actually attracting each other and they're creating a pair. It's called a Cooper pair because Leon Cooper um, was the student that actually solved this problem. It was given a very good problem actually to solve. So. Uh, so he found out that it can create a pair just because of this interaction. And so this is a, a bound state, and it has very interesting properties. So let's get back to the, the reason why. So I wanted to bring a real world example on um, how this pairing happened. Uh, a lot of people into IndyCar? Not many. All right, uh, maybe. So it's similar to the concept of slipstream. Uh, so if you have a fast car in front of you and your car following it, you will suddenly go faster in the moment that you're behind it. So it, it, that creates some sort of small attraction between the two cars. So just to imagine what is the, is the meaning of this. So what are the advantages of pairing? So why is pairing so nice? So, so you can, let's start from the single electrons. So the single electrons actually, in the moment that you add more and more electrons to a material, they are all adding up in different states. So the more you add up, the more you increase the energy of the material. The nice thing about the, electron, the paired electrons is that is they, they can actually stay all in the same quantum state. So we'll try to explain that uh, with basketball. So you can imagine that single electrons are very good one-on-one -on -one players. Let's say James Harden, which is an amazing one-on-one -on -one player. But still, if you have to imagine many, many, many James Harden playing on the same team, that's not, it's not good. It's not going to happen. Well, so you, you have to imagine many different courts almost where to make them play because they always want to have the ball. Instead, in terms of pair electrons, I bring up uh, Curry and Durant. So those are players that love to play together. They play team basketball. And that allows them actually to, to play in a much different way so they can actually play coherently all with each other. They can coordinate. And actually, this is similar to what happened to a superconductor. A superconductor is a material where all the electrons actually pair together, and they decided to stay all in that same wave function. And so it's a macroscopic quantum state. They're all organized. And the way that I can show you in basketball how two players paired together are more powerful than one single player is, is a fast break. So you see here, you have Kerry and Durant. They coordinate each other. They, they kind of interacted they, and they created some, quarter, some sort of coherence between each other. They can decide, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do an Halleyu. And so this is the way that, for example, uh, a bound state can actually overcome a single electron or a single impurity, let's say. So let me get back to the physics. So the, the two uh, electrons here that are paired Let's imagine that the Curry and Durant, they actually can overcome the single defender that was the impurity much more easily. 
and they create a query. So this is a larger object that doesn't care if there is a single defender there. So, so this object can go through impurities with no problem. Okay. You guys liking it so far? All right. So it's important to understand actually that still there are some things that these pairs cannot do. So uh, let's get back to the vibrations that can break, uh, for example, they can hit uh, an electron, right, uh, as a resistance. Well, so typically this object will be able to go through, but in the moment that the vibrations are very strong, so you raise the temperature, there is a temperature at which actually these vibrations will break the Cooper pair. So this is important to know because there is a connection on how strong is the pairing and the critical temperature that we can have a superconductor. So this is actually a physics term that we use. We talk about the glue that keeps these pairs together. So the strongest the glue, the highest the transition temperature that you can have. So this is very important because um, the classical uh, superconductors, they all have a similar glue. So it was actually a very big surprise in 1986 when people found out another family of materials that actually have a very high uh, critical temperature. So this was a turning point for superconductivity. And the big surprise was also that this was coming from ceramic materials, so cuprates. These are materials that have as a, uh, the, the most important part of it is that they're uh, copper oxides. But then there are a lot of other atoms, and I will show you a little bit of the crystal structure of them. But the very surprising thing was that these are very bad conductors. At room temperature, they are not con uh, conducting currents uh, very well. So if you compare it to copper, <laughs> if I put copper, copper is down here in this resistivity plot. So they are much worse than copper. So you would not think that they would have become superconductors. Well, down here, of course, when they become superconductor, of course, they can beat copper. They, they, they become, they actually have, you know, very low resistance. Uh, so this was a big surprise. And after that, that started a whole race to raise the, the critical temperature. So in this plot, there is a lot of points. Um, so these are all the critical temperatures of known superconductors up to 2015. Unfortunately, I couldn't update it because uh, there are more that were discovered recently. But... Um, so these green ones are the classic ones. So the, the one that I described earlier, they started from mercury, lead, and a lot of elemental uh, conductors, and then alloys. And you can see here this breaking point here is actually when uh, cuprates were discovered. So these are uh, still the ones with the highest critical temperature at atmospheric uh, pressure. So these are the ones that I'm particularly interested in. And they're still a mystery. We don't know what is the origin of the pairing for these materials. And let me remark that a pairing bigger than 50 Kelvin, so this point here in this graph, is not possible with the conventional theory. We really need something else. We really need to understand something beyond what is going on in these materials. Uh, something quite interesting, just because I show you a graph with many, many different materials. I want to say, Scientists are really searching everywhere for high TC. So, uh, so this is a study where they took one of these materials that I just showed you, and they dipped it in many different kinds of wine, actually a lot of other things like sake. And, and so they, they tried to see if it was increasing uh, the, the critical temperature. So, and actually they found out there was a relation uh, between the, the concentration of tartaric acid in these uh, wines and the critical temperature. So I'm just saying we're really trying everything with existing materials. Um, and let me go back to the, the, the material that I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about. This is called YBCO for friends. Uh, so this is made of four different elements. So it's a very complex system. It has a very elaborate crystal structure. But what I want to point out is that what matters is actually this area here, where you have these copper oxygen planes we all believe that that's where superconductivity is happening. And one critical aspect is that you need to dope this material. So you see here this delta. When you make and grow this material, you need to tune that quantity uh, really well to have the best superconducting properties. So it's called doping. And that allows you to have the right amount of charge 
in that copper oxygen plane. I will get back to the doping uh, later on. Um, so as we said, we don't know what is the glue that keep together the pairs in this material. So this is the biggest question. Another question, or let's say another comment at this point, is that well, when you try to make a very strong glue, uh, you can have a lot of other phenomena uh, starting to appear. So for example, we can have charge density waves. In the moment that we increase this pairing uh, between the, increase this interaction between the electrons and ions, we can actually have the electrons to be stuck around specific atoms, and they can start organizing ways that look like this. So very far away from that conventional theory that I described before, they can create waves. Uh, so this is very interesting because it's actually something that we observe in these materials. And so this is a phase diagram. This is something that we use a lot in physics to describe uh, what do we have at which temperature and doping. So we have here the temperature of the material, here the doping, there was that important knob that we had in the crystal. And you can see here we have this area where we have superconductivity. So to have the highest superconductivity, you need to be at this point, for example. Then you go to the left, the lower doping, and you have charge density wave. So you start to have a whole different phenomenon that, that start to appear. And you can see here, actually, this, this uh, critical temperature dips around here. So it suggests that there is some sort of competition. But they seem to always appear together in this material. So, it's a very interesting problem. We don't understand totally what is their relationship. Then up here we have this pseudo gap phase. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I'm just going to say that that it has some resemblance uh, um, to superconductivity in some ways. So there are some hints that you can have something similar to superconductivity, but not not quite. Um, so there is hope actually in these materials that we can increase further the, the critical temperature, but uh, we haven't seen that yet, at least at the equilibrium. Okay, so, so far I put together a lot of questions. Uh, so, talking about pairing, talking about friends of foes, so, so charge density waves and superconductivity, are they competing or are they actually helping each other? And can we control them? So, let's try to get some answers on these questions. And the way that we try to get answers uh, here at LCLS at Slack is by using lasers. So let me go back to the initial slide of uh, lasers. So this is actually how they look in real world. These are the lasers that we're using. Those are amplified lasers so they can generate very strong pulses of light and they're actually also very short in time. So this is the critical property of these, of these lasers. So how short? So these pulses are 50 femtosecond long. So 50 femtosecond is 50 millionth of a billionth of a second. So let's try to think on how 50 femtoseconds compare to one second. So it's the same. Uh, so 50 femtosecond is like a blink of an eye in respect to uh, 200,000 years. So where 200,000 years is one second. So you can imagine that this. Um, there is an incredible amount of time between that 50 femtosecond and a second. Um, so 200,000 years, just to have an idea, is, is the time that the Homo sapiens have been on Earth. Um, what can we do with these pulses? So it's actually very interesting because you can use these very short pulses to couple only to electrons in materials. And the reason is because uh, the electrons are fast, they can react very quickly, but ions are slow. So when you send a very fast pulse, this pulse that is 50 femtosecond short, you can actually couple directly to the pairs. You can break them up without delivering any heat to the crystal. So you're actually not warming up the material, you're actually doing a very selective kind of excitation. And this is important because the amount of energy that there is in one pulse is thousands of times smaller than the amount of energy that takes for you to melt a snowflake in your hand as a comparison. So it's a very small amount of energy that you're putting into ma the material, but it's just so well on target. You're hitting exactly the Cooper pairs. You can break them apart, and you can melt a superconductor, but in a purely electronic way. So this is a whole different approach. I started working on this on 
during my PhD. And I get very excited with this topic because I think it's a, it's a breakthrough in the way that we can study materials. OK, so the type of experiments that we do are actually pump probe experiment. We use a pump to excite the material and a probe to observe it. So this is a concept that is very important, so we'll try to really bring it home. And I'm going to use the help of Marty McFly for this. So we have Marty McFly flying on his overboard. That's a superconductor. And now we're going to shoot a laser beam on that superconductor and break the overboard, and it falls. So what I just did is exactly a pump probe experiment. So our video is actually our probe. So the camera is taking screenshots. We're observing what's going on. And we have this pump that it sets a time where something happened. So this is exactly the type of experiment that we do in our labs. So let me go again on this parallelism. This probe was the camera that takes like shots of light. Let's say the frame rate of the camera is telling you, OK, what's going on with Marty McFly? And the pump was actually the one that created something happen. So this is the way that we can make videos in the lab. The interesting thing is that we can make these videos with 50 femtoseconds, that blink of an eye over 200,000 years, right? So something very, very fast. We can make videos that you cannot do otherwise. In an actual palm probe experiment, we control very precisely the distance of the paths between two laser pulses. So we can tune it around and move it around so that we can take an image of a material. So we can take a reflection, for example. We can take an image on the microscopic arrangements. And we can always plot what's going on. And this is going to be our video, basically. OK, so what kind of question I want to answer with this kind of experiment? So in particular, I'm interested in the connection between Cooper pairs, the one that established superconductivity, and these charge density waves. Because it is fascinating. They seem to compete in some ways, but they're both uh, connected to the same pairing in some ways. They're all connected to uh, something, some electrons that come together, come closer together, you can imagine. So we want to understand what is the relationship, and can we control them with a pulse of light? OK, so to do this exper experiment, everything is extreme. So we need really specialized equipment. So let me go back to the quantities that we're dealing in with. So these waves are actually at the nanometer scale. So to understand how a nanometer is in terms of compared to like normal sizes, um, so imagine that a human air, this is a parallel world, a human air is actually big as the Empire State Building. Okay. Uh, if you imagine that, a nanometer is like a pebble at the very bottom of the Empire State Building. So this is, this was the human air, Empire State Building, and so this is like a very, very small, small length scale. Okay, so this is an important one, and then we had the 50 femtosecond, that blink of an eye over 200,000 years, and then we have the cryogenic temperature. So this is all. The, the quantities that are involved in this experiment. And to do this, we need to come at Slack and use this X-ray free electron laser. Why do we need it? Because X-rays are the ones that allow us to see objects at the nanometer. So we can study the ultra small with ultra fast pulses. So this is very important. We have to come here to do this experiment. So with the, with the pulses from, from LCLS, we can take a very quick snapshot. And this is actually a map of one of these materials, you can see there are waves. They're maybe not exactly like lines, as I drew before, like those stripes. They're more like checkerboard. And whenever there are waves like this, we will have a signal uh, from the X-rays that actually look like this. So you, you imagine here on this axis, you have the periodicity. And you see, oh, all of a sudden, I have a periodicity there. There are waves. And then we can use a second pulse of light to excite the material and try to make a video and see what happened to the material. So it's easier said than done, because as I said before, LCLS is a very long accelerator. So actually, our probe, our X-ray pulses, are generated over this kilometer-long accelerator. So it's actually uh, it's generated here, but the experiment is performed down there. And that's where we have our lasers. So you have to imagine, how do we connect these two pulses? We have to hit. Exactly at the same time, 
You have to have two persons blinking the eyes at the exact same time and at the exact same point. So this is pretty tricky and that, that's what we spend the most time on <laughs> in these experiments. Um, this is myself while I do the experiment. This is actually not an actual moment of the experiment. I generally have no time to do photos during my experiments. Um, we generally get allotments of time that are like 12 hours to do the experiment and everything worked just in the last hour, maybe 30 minutes. So, so you generally have no time to take pictures, so that's, that's what happened to me. And so I took a picture in another moment where I was very relaxed. Uh, but um, yeah, the experiments are hectic. They're very exciting though. It's like there's a big team of people I will sh show later. The, the list of people involved is incredible. It's all a teamwork. So these experiments are exciting. These are the, the kind of equipment that we use. We have to use these big chambers that create vacuum inside uh, for several reasons. Why, as I said, we have cryogenic temperatures, so we cannot have them in air. All the water and, and things in the air will just condense on the materials. But also, the soft X rays that we're using actually cannot travel in air, so we need to create vacuum anyway. OK, so this is the first experiment we did. We used the X ray pulses to measure the waves, charge density waves. And we used a relatively powerful pulse here, and we went up here in this point of the phase diagram. So there's only charge density wave, no superconductivity so far. And we're out with the pulse. One here is the value at equilibrium. So let's assume there is one, your starting point, and I'll play this again. The pulse arrive here at zero. We're actually melting the charge density wave with the laser pulse. And then they recover over this uh, course of time. So 2,000 femtosecond, 4,000 femtosecond. This is actually an experiment that, that wasn't completely new. A lot of other people did it. It's just our starting point. The interesting aspect of it is that you understand that this is the primary function of lasers. How we generally use lasers is to destroy things. We often use them to quench some kind of order that is established in the material and study how it, it comes back together. So this is a very inter interesting experiment, but not directly the one that we're interested in in this specific topic. But I want to just point out, you can use the laser to destroy the waves, and that's actually what we have seen so far. All the experiments that were, that were done so far mostly saw melting of waves with lasers. But we want to study what happened when you have superconductivity. So here we did the experiment with the X-rays, and we also did another experiment with an optical pulse. And the reason why we did that is to follow superconductivity in real time. We want to have a video that sees both superconductivity and the charge density waves. So you can imagine that when you have superconductivity, the material just becomes very slightly more shiny. And so you can see that tiny change of reflectivity with an optical pulse. And so you can build again the trace, and you can see how it changes. OK, so let's come to the actual experiment. So here we had both superconductivity and charge density waves. So you can see this light blue here, the charge density wave and the Cooper pair. We arrive with the laser and we measure both charge density wave and superconductivity. So what happened here, we quench superconductivity, we break the Cooper pairs, and the charge density wave came up. So this was something completely different than what we observed so far. It was the moment that we're actually generating waves. And we understood that this was an effect of competition. It means that in the moment that I quench supercon superconductivity, the charge ends will wave come up. And the interesting thing in, in taking a video of it is that you can see this difference in the reaction in time. So the, the superconductivity gets quenched very quickly right after the pulse arrive, but the charge ends wave take actually a, a considerable amount of time to generate. So this is actually helping us to understand um, what is the interaction between charge density waves and superconductivity. So we're really trying to get to the bottom of this. And it, it's also helping us understand if they are connected to the same glue. Uh, so this is also very important. The other very interesting aspect about it is that this means that we can use laser pulses to actually generate an order. We can generate waves and at the same time, this means that we can control uh, these materials. So before, I said we had mostly the doping to control what was going on in these materials. So now we can actually have laser that allows you to do that. 
So, and this connects me to a very exciting uh, result from a group in Hamburg where they used also SLS to see um, the effects of photo induced superconductivity. That's the counterpart. And in some way, our experiment shows that this is possible because we, we have done it in a way that is, um, can be fully understood. Uh, in, in this case, it's still controversial. Uh, we don't totally understand what's the mechanism for this, but by using different pulses of light, we can actually induce uh, superconductivity at higher temperatures. And there are some claims that we can actually see them at room temperature. So this is very exci exciting and brings me back to room temperature sup superconductivity and what, is, what are the main dream applications of it and really hoping that at some point we'll be able to deliver that. And so that will really change the way that we use it for energy efficiency, for example. So you don't need to cool it down if you have a room temperature superconductor. And so we can imagine that we will be able to improve a lot the energy efficiency in our world. And you can imagine that you can do quantum computers that are actually in your phone. And so the quantum computers will be something that will be much easier to build if you have a room temperature superconductor. You don't need to cool down the whole, uh, the whole system. And then, of course, I saw actually there is this project from, from Volkswagen so, um, of like a flying levitating car. This is something that room temperature superconductors will make much more possible because you can have levitation without actually needing a uh, cooling uh, um, effect on this, on this superconductor. So let me acknowledge all the people involved. This, this was a great experiment, and uh, this is the list of all the people that, that, that helped us make it possible. It's a big collaboration between LCLS here at Slack and a lot of different university, um, University of British Columbia, uh, University of Brescia, SSRL, which is the synchrotron here at Slack, University of Waterloo, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, a lot of people involved. And I want to thank you for your attention. And thank you so much. So Giacomo, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. And um, why don't you raise your hand and be recognized. Every one of you has a microphone in front of you. So when you, it's time to ask your question, just push the red button in front of you and your microphone will be active. Uh, just remember that only one microphone can be active at a time. So when you're done, turn it off. Okay, please. You showed that the X-rays energy could vary anywhere between 100 EV to 100 KV or a very wide range. So it's making an analogy, and so you're modulating it, uh, making an envelope of that, uh, which is 50, 50 femtosecond long. Um, it's like you have a carrier wave on, uh, that you modulate uh, making a packet, uh, speaking in terms of a radio. Which is more important for efficiency of, uh, for, for generating this uh, density waves? The overall envelope uh, length that is 50 femtosecond or the, the, the X-ray uh, carrier wave energy? So first of all, I want to clarify one thing on that. Um, that's the uh, tunability range of the X-ray source here. Uh, we generally work at one specific energy. And the reason why we do that in this experiment is because we want to be resonant on, on one particular atomic transition. So there we're seeing the transition between the copper and oxygen. And so one specific energy to see that modulation. We can only see that modulation if we tune the energy on one specific atomic transition. Um, so we're not using the whole range. Just one clarification. To go back to what is the critical aspect to generate waves, pulse duration, absolutely central. Because um, if you make a longer pulse, it would just bring heat to the material. And so it's critical to observe this competition effect in dynamical terms by just quenching superconductivity uh, preferentially in a non-thermal manner. So that's, that's the, so the pulse duration is the critical. Oh, but aspect. maybe it's worth clarifying. Um, 50 femtoseconds sounds like a very short time. But actually, it's the, if you think about the speed of light, it's a micron. 
and the wavelength is the size of an atom. It's much smaller. So inside that pulse, it looks like just a wave at a fixed frequency. And, but it's still, because these distances are so you know, out of human range, it can be an incredibly short pulse and yet contain thousands of waves of the X-ray. It's amazing. Please. Oh, okay. Have you uh, studied other classes of materials or other materials? And if so, is the results similar or are they varying from different classes of materials? So we've done this experiment only on cuprates. I can tell you that there is a much wider class of materials where the melting of waves has been observed. Uh, so that experiment has been done on many different charge order materials, stripes materials, the materials that have different kind of ordering. But the specific result of the announcement is uh, we just observed it, and, and it's only on that material. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember from my studies long ago. Uh, Cooper pairs, am I right that the electrons in Cooper pairs are entangled with each other? Um, they form a bound state, which is in some way similar to what you can imagine to have in an entangled state. But I would not say that it's directly related, just because entanglement was what we used to refer to in the concept of transferring information. Uh, mm -hmm. So in this case, Cooper pairs are not something that will allow us to transfer information. In okay, sense. but they're, so they're not really technically entangled with each other in a quantum no, sense? I would not say. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So what is the current understanding of the relationship between the charge density wave and Cooper pairs of superconductivity? So there is mounting evidence of the competition. So certainly they are competing, uh, but it's more complicated than that, I would say. Um, so our results also suggest competition and will allow us to tell what is the interaction strength between them. And it's a new tool that we have now to study a lot of different materials. Uh, the reason why I say it's more complicated is because people think that maybe the competition happens when these charge density waves are static, when they get fixed in, in, in space and they get bound to specific Befex, for example. But um, in the moment that these charge density waves are dynamics, are dynamical in the material, maybe the relationship is different. So this is a very hot topic of research right now because we know that there are fluctuations of these charge density waves. And we need to find better experimental tools to be able to observe them. And we want to understand what is their relationship to superconductivity. It could be that when you have the static charge waves, they compete with superconductivity. But when they're fluctuating, maybe they're not. So I would say that the current understanding is still, we know that there is a competition, but we know it's also more complicated than that. So that's why we need new experimental tools for it. So yeah, it's a uh, life question is also related to the Cooper pairs. So I would ask like, why is a Cooper pair, why is it not a triplet? Or if you treat this pair as a two unit charge, a unit, a new particle, why not a new Cooper pair for this two unit uh, charge particle then? So I didn't say, you said, why is not a triplet? Yeah, why is not a three particle from the bound state? And why is not if you treat a two, the pair as a, Minus two E unit, right? You can find another pair, right? Yep. <laughs> There's another Cooper well, pair. I mean, yeah. it's, it, the, you raise a good point, actually. BCS theory, the starting point is the Cooper pair, but you know these pairs are actually traveling in opposite directions. The the electrons, right? They opposite. They have opposite momentum. So it's all a collective state of all the electrons. They, I, I don't, I don't envision the Cooper pairs to be a static thing that really goes around. I know that I that's exactly how depicted here, but in real materials. It's almost like they're picking a pair, but it's a momentary time, right? And then they'll pick another pair. And it's just a dynamical process that involves all the electrons. So the pairing is just the starting point in some sense. Um, mm -hmm. But then it involves all the electrons. And we believe this theory just yeah, like yeah. can explain. <laughs> Certainly, maybe. we'll get a complicated theory if you start to put three, four particles. Maybe you yeah. should say also that it's the weirdness of quantum mechanics. One electron, they repel each other. Two, when you put them together, 
they form a fluid. Three, they start repelling each other again. Well, but we have also the atom here. So um, that's an odd quantum mechanical thing. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, uh, you mentioned that you were a drummer. Uh, could you uh, Still mention? a drummer. Yeah, all right. Could you mention the name of your band and where we could find you on YouTube? Trabant. The band is called Trabant and is like the East German uh, car. And so you can find a lot of videos on YouTube. Unfortunately, we just got kicked out from iTunes, uh, but I'll make sure that we come back. <laughs> no worries. Okay, way in the back. Uh, I have a question about uh, superconductor and uh, them having a zero resistance. So I, you know, I, we know that at superconductor the temperature is fairly low, but it's not zero, right? So if it's not zero, then uh, then the, all the particles they are not in motion. So uh, how can we say that uh, the uh, it has zero resistance, even though at, even at a room temperature or way below? Uh, uh, close to absolute zero, the particles are still in motion. So, how how, how does the resistance become goes to zero, or does it approximate to zero? So, there are still ways in which um, we can have a finite resistance in um, superconductors, but it's a completely different process in respect to uh, normal materials. So, for example, you can have vortices of magnetic field in a superconductor, and the moment that you try to drive a current they can actually create some resistance. So the notion that all superconductors are purely resistance equal to zero is not correct. There are some effects also in superconductors where you can have some resistance. That is correct. But there are some subtypes of, of superconductors, the type 1 superconductors, where you don't have these vortices. And in that, in that case, you can uh, the resistance is not measurable. In that case. Is, is that where it's the not, It's not measurable. You cannot, it's, it's really zero from all the practical so terms. Is that, uh, is that where you, uh, you mentioned about the transition period. So how does that involve the, the I mean, transition, what? transition period where the material turns into superconductor? Is that where the, uh, uh, where the quantum mechanics come in, comes in or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, During your initial portion of your talk, you talked about the wave function for a single electron. I'm just kind of curious, is there some kind of theory about the uh, a combined wave function of the Cooper pairs, like a superposition of some kind, like it, a new? Because uh, in particular, you mentioned uh, that they were able to bypass impurities. You know, as if they're kind of some kind of coherent larger wave that can just like ignore that smaller impurity. Right. So BCS theory is the one that deal with the many body wave function of this material. So in the moment that you start having these paired together, they created a theory in BCS theory where they can try to represent this, this wave function. Of course, it's, it's, it's a collective wave function at that point. So it's made easier by that, that aspect. Um, I'm not a scientist. But I wanted to know um, if you could speak about this uh, notion of new investigative tools. Can you talk about that? New investigative tools? You yes, want... you need new tools to examine the stuff deeper. Right. So I think we always need. So what I want to say is that there are always some mysteries that we still don't cannot solve or don't understand about physics. So I think we need to have more ways to see matter in, in space and time to really be able to understand uh, how the materials work. So in this particular field, we still haven't solved the mystery of superconductivity, what is the pairing. And we don't have the tool that can really make us visualize uh, what is happening at the microscopic le level. How are these pairs formed? What is their pairing glue? Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we need better uh, experimental tools. And I think uh, LCLS is one, but there are many other approaches that, that can be helpful to understand these materials. Uh, let's take, um, there are a number of hands up, three more questions. So, um, sir? Uh, I want your take on the recent... 
Uh, recently, MIT published a, a superconductor with two sheets of uh, graphenes lining up with the magic angle, so you can turn it right. from an insulator into a superconductor. Can you say something about it? So this is a very new research topic, so I, do, I don't have that much insight yet, also because it's, it's an open question for the field. Um, what I want to say is that, well, certainly we know graphene is a superconductor. It, it becomes superconducting at much lower temperatures than what I showed uh, here, for example, for ITC, but we know that it's a starting point in graphene. And um, it's interesting that when you put uh, two layers of graphene together, it starts to resemble what we have in these superconductors where you have a co two copper oxygen planes. Uh, but the fact of when you tune these magic angles, that's really a magic trick that, trick that is specific for graphene. But you can imagine that's similar to the doping case. In some sense, you're really tuning the, the energy differences between these two planes. So you need always a tool that allows you to, to tune the properties of a material and try to find uh, superconducting behavior. Uh, so it can be also related to charging homogeneities. We know that there are charging homogeneities, and um, who knows, maybe we'll find out that there are charges to weights there too. It's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting topic, though. So I know you said, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that the transition temperature for the cuprates was like 30, and that was pretty exciting when that was discovered. But at what temperature and pressure combination do you imagine that a new material is potentially found at that would have like widespread application? We could use like those levitating cars and things like right. that. Like what would that material let look me, like? Let me clarify one thing. Um, 30 was the temperature where it was discovered. But then after that, maybe I didn't stress that enough. We found that it is actually getting up to 100 uh, under 40 Kelvin, more or less. So that's the highest DC we can get from cuprates. 140, it's, the important thing is that it's above liquid nitrogen. So having the liquid nitrogen is much easier than liquid helium. Uh, so you, that's why, so the overboard that I showed before, the one that they realize is using liquid nit nitrogen. Um, so that's already making um, superconductivity more accessible. So we need to make the next leap here. So we're missing still, we're halfway room temperature. We need to make that other leap. So there are recent um, discoveries about uh, superconductors at high pressure where it seems that they can reach room temperature. But then you have another problem that you need to apply giant pressures. So it's not going to solve the applicability problem. So in some sense we want to find out if we can use laser light to, to help this and maybe it can be a device that constantly keep a material into a special state. But we're still far away, but I hope we're not that far away. I'm hoping that in my career I will see it happening. Okay, last question, uh, sir. Uh, in your experience with high temperature superconductors, what do you think could be uh, the uh, responsible mechanism for pairing? Is it like the D-wave pairing that they usually talk about? or? Okay, so on this, that's a very good question, and I think I'm trying always to be agnostic about it because I notice a lot in science, people tend to make their own opinion, say, oh, I think it's electron-phonon interaction, that would be the, the interaction with ions, or no, it's electron-electron interaction. You can't pick side until you really see the experimental evidence. So what I want to say is that we know it's something beyond uh, electron-ion pairing, but people are doing wonderful theories about how this pairing actually look different in the moment that you have only specific modes of the motion of the ions that couple to the electrons. So I, I'm, so that is so we if you exclude that you're missing a lot on like the possibilities. Uh, then the other source of pairing that is discussed is the electron-electron pairing, uh, and that, of course, is more open because we haven't seen yet one material where we have uh, this purely electron-electron pairing. But it's, it's a developing field, and I think it, I, I tend to be agnostic until the moment that I find really the evidence. 
Well, let's thank Giacomo again.